Hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Um, we are, I am, I am excited because we actually have, we're launching a brand new webinar series today with um, uh, a special guest because, well, let me ask the, the series first. Um, it's Translating Parrot and it's with Pamela Clark. We have Pamela Clark with us right now. Welcome, Pamela. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. <laughs> but, so um, happy to be here. So happy to have you. This is kind of a, a semi reunion of sorts because Pamela is, uh, you know, has written for a lot of uh, publications, including Bird Talk magazine, um, uh, back in the day when we when we had Bird Talk. <laughs> so, so very excited to to be um, back uh, in the bird world with you. Um, so very you. excited. New series, translating parrot. Um, let's see. And uh, so, if you're just joining us, uh, do you want to just a, a little bit of background on what you've been up to? Um, Pamela, since bought boy, since uh, used to write the the articles for us for Bird Talk and many other publications. Um. <laughs> I, I don't know that you want me to go that far back, but <laughs> so let just me a just glimpse. <laughs> I'll give you a little glimpse. You know, I um, retired from veterinary medicine in uh, two. <laughs> this is yeah. terrible. I, you know, time flies. It was probably four years ago now. And so ever since then, I've just been working on blog posts. Um, this year has been exciting and busy because I decided to become a mentor. And I now have a group of 21 amazing people from all over the world um, who serve as my mentees. And we have um, a very good time together. So that has taken up a huge chunk of time this year. And now I am just getting my blog post, um, my blog back up and running again. That's going to be next. Nice. So getting that bird, uh, spreading the, the wealth of bird knowledge that you have. So that's always Thank a you. great way to give yeah. back, right? <laughs> that's right. Um, so we, uh, so yeah, I, I, this is our first episode of, of uh, the webinar series. Um, and we have some really exciting topics, um, that I've, that coming down the pipeline. So, um, uh, it, we, uh, so if you have a, we are maybe gonna have time for questions at the end of the webinar, but, um, if you do have a question, save it, uh, for after the webinar, uh, you could put in the, sorry, put in the Q and a, um, feature, not the chat feature, and we'll, um, try to get to it at the end. A little winded here. Um, so I also, um, I think you have a wonderful uh, screen presentation for us. So uh, I do. we have a little bit of territory to cover and, and see what questions we can answer at the end. Um, maybe I'll have you kickstart this and uh, welcome. If you're just joining us, uh, we're on with a new web webinar series, Translating Parrot with Pamela Clark. This should be exciting. We're going to cover uh, travel. Is it right for your bird, right? There we go. That's summertime right. so yeah <laughs> it's it's a good it's a timely timely topic of many ways i think it is yes okay hopefully everybody can share my screen please let brendan know if you can't as you all know we're going to be talking about traveling with your parrot because as we all know our absences pose a huge dilemma um we love our birds madly and we don't like leaving them, but sometimes it's absolutely necessary that we do so. Some of the things that make traveling difficult are some of the things we feed. We have specialized diets like chop mix, you know, I feed that to my birds in the morning. So how do I continue to provide them chop if I'm traveling on the road with them or even just leaving them behind with somebody else? What if you have a bird that can't be handled? Or what if you have fully flighted parrots as I do? The, that poses um, some significant degrees of challenge to traveling with your birds or leaving them at all. So good solutions can be very hard to find. So that's our first decision that we're gonna face when we have to leave or want to leave. Do we take our birds with us or do we leave them behind? So obviously, this is going to be a decision informed by lots of different things. How many birds do you have and how big are they? It's obviously going to be a lot harder traveling with green-winged macaws than it is with budgies. Um, it doesn't mean that you are precluded from doing so. You're just going to need um, 
to plan a little bit more carefully. Also, your destination, is it a place that you can reasonably take the birds or not? And then some parrots themselves will be really great candidates for travel and some not so much. So we'll talk a bit more uh, before we end today about how you figure those things out. But before I talk about traveling and taking your birds with you, I want to just run through the preference of options or the hierarchy of preference, say, related to options if you can't take your birds with you, because that is equally as much of a, a, a dilemma. And um, so at any rate, I think the best choice is for caregivers to come and stay in your home. The reason for this is because obviously the birds then have access to their usual environment, their cages, everything is the same for them, only the people are different. Uh, the second best choice, I think, is if the birds go to a caregiver's home. So maybe you can identify a friend who might be open to learning about your birds and decide to offer that as a benefit to you. The one of the advantages related to both of these options is that the social schedule of the people involved stays about the same. Because most people have similar schedules in that they get up in the morning, they you know probably have some time at home before they go to work or otherwise engage in uh, a work-related activity, and then they're off again in the evenings and able to have a social time at that point. Birds get used to this kind of rhythm for their days with us. And so it is an advantage for both of those first two options that they have that in place for them as well. So obviously that's a disadvantage of the third option, which is boarding them at a veterinary clinic because the daily schedule is flipped. Nobody's there first thing in the morning. And then there's a large body of activity um, of you know everybody who works at the clinic during the day. And then at five or six, when life usually starts for parrots, everybody leaves and it's quiet again. So that can be stressful. So you may be wondering, why would I put boarding at a veterinary clinic above boarding at a parrot, you know, a dedicated facility for parrot boarding? There aren't many of those around, but many of you may have heard of avian suites. That's a good example of a, an excellent parrot boarding facility. The only reason why I have veterinary clinics above those is because in a veterinary clinic, you have specific practices and applications that everyone is required to adhere to. So it's very unlikely that your bird is going to get boarded at a vet clinic and come home with a disease, which could happen conceivably, if they were boarding at a less tightly regulated facility. I mean, veterinary clinics use all kinds of different disinfectants for different purposes, and they will know which are the right ones to use in uh, a given case. So I think the birds are just slightly safer in a vet clinic. A parrot boarding facility, you know, those are going to be run by individuals. So each facility is only going to be as good as the individual that owns and operates that facility. So, you know, there's some room for some loosey goosey behavior there, possibly. Parrot stores, I believe. Generally speaking, there's always going to be exceptions, but parrot stores are not good places to board birds because there's generally a lot of turnover and you cannot be sure that there's going to be consistency amongst staff members in terms of disinfection, cleaning cages, handling the birds, that sort of thing. One of my mentees just recently stopped working 
worked at a pet store that boards birds. And one of the reasons she stopped working there was because of the very poor care that the birds were, who were boarding there were being given. And then the last option, leaving the bird at home alone with a stranger coming in or even someone that they know coming in twice a day to take care of them. I would never recommend that for a bird. Uh, you know, parrots are flock animals. And even if you have other birds, it doesn't make it better for them if you leave them at home alone, because your birds orient towards you as the most important, valuable flock member. Um, yes, they derive some sense of support from the fact that there are other birds in the room. But if you leave your birds at home alone, um, that's going to create significant degrees of stress for them, which may mean that they might behave in ways they ordinarily do not, which could put them at risk. Parrots can do some crazy things and they can get themselves in trouble. So you just don't want to have a situation like this. The often unexplored option is the simplest one, really. You just take your parrot with you by plane or by car. And I know that it probably seems impossible to most of you listening right now, but it's really not. And I'm going to show you why it's not. So how have I gained my experience? Well, I started out back in 1996. I was breeding Congo African greys and I refused to ship them. So I required that people would travel to my home by plane and then hand carry the parrots with them in the cabin back home. That afforded me um, knowledge of just how well parrots adapt to things, how flexible they can be, and how something that we might anticipate would, would be terribly scary for them really is not. Um, the birds that I sent home with new owners, granted they were babies, but they all did really, really well. I had one situation, in fact, where a gentleman flew from Okinawa, Japan to my home to pick his baby bird up. And then he drove with his baby bird down to Los Angeles because his flight for Okinawa did not take off until the very next day. And he was going to stay at the home of his father that night. So. He just had a small little um, travel cage for the car, but he did also have a bigger travel cage that he had purchased for that one night at his dad's house. And he was really glad that he had done that because he had that cage for that night. But then the next day, he spent that entire day in the airport. The plane never took off. They boarded a couple times and then deplaned a couple times. So he then had to go back to his, um, actually, he didn't go back to his dad's house. He went to a hotel that night and he just had the little baby perch up on top of the shower rod for the night. And, you know, because he didn't have either of his travel cages with him at that point, he just had the carrier for the plane. And then the next morning they did take off. He had a 13 hour flight to Okinawa and then a four hour flight to his island. And that bird never missed a beat. So this is how we can so incredibly, um, you know, misread our parrots and what they are capable of enjoying, much less surviving. I also, back then, I did a lot of traveling just to for weekend visits to parrot-related conferences. In 2002, I moved from California to Oregon with 14 parrots. That was a travel period of just one day. It actually took me 14 hours. It was a very long day, but it was more experience um, packed into my little quiver of arrows. And then last year, as you know, I relocated from Oregon to Indiana. And um, I'm not the only one crazy enough to travel with their birds. I've had a lot of clients along the way who thought they might like to do it. They weren't sure how to approach it. So we helped brainstorm it together and then evaluated the results as well. 
The one thing that people are most worried about above all is the stress of the experience for the bird. Can my parrot handle it? And I think those concerns are reasonable. We know that parrots are neophobic, which means they're afraid of new things. And that, and, and we do have a lot of anecdotal evidence that new environments can cause at least enough stress that parrots will alter their behavior. The most common example of that is that period of time after a bird changes homes that is often referred to as the honeymoon period. We know that if a bird was aggressive in his last home, he may not be aggressive in the new home until he's habituated to staying there. Um, but the real question that we must answer is how much stress is too much? And as I've intimated already, that rarely is a concern, but we will talk more about that later. For now, let's look at the other concerns that people worry about. How are the birds gonna do in the car? What if you get started driving and they're totally stressed out? What are you gonna do? Also, if you're gonna stay for a day or more at your um, destination, they're obviously gonna be contained to a much smaller cage. Is that gonna be okay for them? Some of the uh, most serious concerns though are about the trouble that your parents might get you into if you take them with you. What if they bite somebody at the destination? You know, it, we know our parents are loud at home and that fact itself makes many people think that they could never take their parents with them because if they are gonna be that loud at the destination, then there's no way it's gonna be a successful trip. But in fact, adaptation to traveling really comes naturally to parrots. There are many parrot species that today travel large distances in order to forage. And there are species of parrots that actually migrate hundreds of miles also. So depending upon the species that you have in your homes, there may be genetic memories that help these birds you know, have these experiences without really any sign of stress. So what's the real key to whether your bird is going to be okay, whether your bird is going to feel safe enough and secure enough during the travel? How, how do we know he's going to feel okay? Well, because he's with you, you are his flock. And he's going to be up for any challenge as long as he's with you and he can see that you are okay and doing just fine. They will take our leads for us. And then another fact is that we can prepare birds for travel by training them. So even if you think that a bird you have in your house right now might not be a good candidate for travel, you can turn them into a good, tra uh, a good candidate for travel. How do you do that? Just simply by training because new experiences change the brain. We have wide evidence now that as New skills are learned, new neural pathways are created. Birds become smarter, they become more confident. They, their personality literally changes. So the more a bird learns, the more able and capable they can become. You know, I, this is a, an aside, but I often kind of marvel over the fact that the parrots that we have these days I think are smarter than the parrots that we used to have because the parrots that we have these days have access to challenges they may have been deprived of earlier, like flight, for instance, being able just to fly to navigate their way around a house. Flight makes parrots smarter. Foraging makes parrots smarter. So the poor birds that we had 25 years ago that lived with clipped wings and maybe just one or two toys from Petco, those birds didn't have the ability to really build intelligence or skills or capabilities. So I say this because I want you to realize that your birds are not just these static creatures. Um, so anyway, 
Who were my travelers for my Oregon to Indiana venture? Meet Sarah No, who is 47 years old. Chucky and Ruby are 16 and four years of age. They are a bonded pair. And Marco is 26 years old. She's one of those babies that I raised back from when I was breeding. So uh, it was a journey of approximately 2,300 miles. I planned for six days on the road, driving only about six hours a day. I figured that, you know, it was going to take me an hour or two in the morning before I got on the road, and then an hour or two at night. So I really didn't think I could handle driving more than six hours a day. I was doing this all alone. I didn't have a co-pilot, and I didn't want to um, overestimate my capabilities. Because, you know, if your birds are depending upon you, what have you got to do? You got to take care of yourself first, right? So that's what I was doing. Another way of taking care of myself and my birds was to make sure that we stayed at Airbnbs rather than hotels. I think a hotel would be fine with one or two birds. And there certainly are hotels that allow parrots to stay there. Um, but the advantages of the Airbnbs were that they were less formal, of course, they were homes or resembled homes, so the birds were going to be more comfortable there than in a more artificially um, outfitted hotel room. The Airbnbs were also less expensive, and they were better suited to our needs because they all had at least a minimal kitchen uh, that I could use uh, to make ice and, you know, cook food for the birds and myself. So my advice, if you're going to choose a carrier for traveling in the car, is to choose a collapsible wire carrier like this, as opposed to an acrylic carrier or uh, a dog and cat, you know, hard-sided plastic carrier. Here are my reasons. They're similar to cages visually. Our birds are used to staying in cages. They're comfortable in cages. And so this is just another cage. It's also very easy to add food and water dishes to them. They are also less likely to trigger nesting behavior. And this was a big deal to me because my Moluccan cockatoo, Cyrano, if you show him a dog or a cat carrier, he dives in there and immediately starts the beak flacking and the tongue wagging. You know, he relates to that sort of space as a nest cavity. And I did not think that providing him with 36 hours of nesting experience was something I wanted to do. So it was especially important that he ride in one of these carriers. And then I also was able to use these as perches for the birds to eat on because the dishes that I used were the quick lock frocks. Forgive me, I meant to have one here as an example, but for those of you who are familiar with these um, types of dishes that you can add to cages, they have a protuberance on the bottom. And that protuberance will fit between the bars on the top of that cage. And then you can twist it a 90 degree twist so that the birds cannot take those food dishes and throw them off the tops of the carriers. Very important. Other equipment and supplies I brought along. This is a picture of an Ava station. It is the play stand that Nyla Cop sells from her uh, website, mybirdiebuddy.com. These are fantastic for traveling. Every single one of those branches comes off. The upright post itself comes apart. It comes away from the base and it comes apart into two pieces. So this was easy to fit into my car in between other things. Um, and then I also had a second PVC perch that's just a simple little training perch that also came apart that I took with me. And then in addition to that, I brought two large tarps, two large sheets, two large towels, and a cooler for the car. 
And then it's important that you have a dedicated bag for all of your parent stuff. Because if you're going to have multiple days on the road like this, you're going to wind up feeling confused. That is just what happens to humans on the road. So if you can put all of your parrot stuff in one bag, and similarly, I had all of my dog stuff in another bag, you know, if I was feeling confused and tired from a sleepless night and too many days on the road, I could at least figure out that the dog food is likely to be in the dog bag. <laughs> so it was a real assist for me to keep everything consolidated. Now, diet on the road deserves a special mention here. Uh, obviously, you're going to bring your normal diet, but you also want to hedge your bet uh, and provide something unhealthy as well. I don't think your birds will be too stressed to eat their normal diet on the road. Mine definitely weren't, but I wanted to make I didn't know for sure whether they would eat their pellets on the road. And I wasn't sure that I could have chop mix. You know, I had hoped that on my third, I had chop mix for the first two days. And I thought, well, hopefully I can hit a grocery store on the third day and then make more chop mix that night. That was my plan, but that was not what happened. Um, and so here's what I did. I went and got a bag of a good quality seed mix. It was a Volkman seed mix. And then I went to Trader Joe's and I got two of their semi-healthy Trek mixes that had nuts, raw nuts and uh, dried fruit. And I mixed that in with the seed mix. And so while we were on the road, that's what the parrots got to have in their carriers. And I knew that, you know, they're all sluts for seed mixes. And so I knew that my birds would be just fine. Um, they would stay eating. And to me, that was the most important thing. Now, the provision of water for your birds while you're on the road can be tricky because there's no way that you can fill the water dish up, put it in the carrier, and then put the bird into the carrier, and then carry that out to the car without spilling all the water that you put in the dish. So I didn't even try to do that. But I did make sure that I had ice cubes made the night before. And I regularly made, I stopped enough just to get some watermelon or other types of juicy fruit that the birds could have on the road. So every morning I just put, I filled their dishes with ice cubes and those melted along the road and the birds were just fine. And moreover, if you're on the road for only six hours, you know, birds don't drink that much. Your birds are not gonna become dehydrated from not having all the water they want because my advice is don't let your birds out of the carrier in the car. That is dangerous. And my birds are fully flighted. There was no way that I was gonna open that, you know, so there was not even any way that I could pour water into the dish by opening the carrier door. I just was not gonna take that chance and it's not necessary. That's what I want to reassure you about here. So what was our daily process? Just to sum it all up, after six hours of driving, I would arrive at our new destination. I would get out, go open the door and kind of survey our new digs for the night. Then I would bring the birds in. It was hot, we were traveling at the end of August. So I couldn't leave them in the car while I brought the rest of the stuff in. So I brought the birds in first, then I brought in everything else. I would, I spread the tarps down over any floor space that was usable and set the PVC perches up over the tarps. And then I spread the sheets out over the couch and the dining room table. And then I covered up any other delicate things with the towels. Then I fed the birds dinner on top of their carriers. We just hung out till it was time to go to bed. They just picked wherever they wanted to sleep that night. 
uh, Ruby and Chucky always chose the Ava station, and Marco had her um, her other little PVC perch that she liked, and and Cyrano just hung out on a carrier. Then the next morning, we got up early. I fed the birds. They ate while I cleaned everything up um, as much as I could. Then I got them in their carriers while I picked up the tarps and shook them off outside and then loaded the car up and off we went. It was really pretty streamlined of an effort. And I even got good reviews. You know, when you stay at an Airbnb, the hosts can review you as the visitor. I got good reviews. The person with the parrots, they never even knew that I had a parrot. Wow. So how did we do? We killed it. I got to tell you, I, I mean, I was tired. I was exhausted. I don't think I knew fully who I was for the two to three days after I arrived. So it was a lot, but the birds survived far better than I did. They never showed any signs of stress. Um, and we had fun. It was just a good experience all the way around. So I encourage you to consider this. There are many benefits of traveling with parrots. You will build stronger flock bonds. And I think this is something that very few people know about parrots. Um, but it is true that if you travel through space and time with your parrots, they will become more strongly bonded towards you as well as to each other. My four parrots that I brought with me, they did not, they were not a cohesive group before we left Oregon, but they were by the time we arrived here. They now happily, they'll all perch on the same cage together. And they would never have done that before we left Oregon. Um, this can actually have, um, it, can, it can strengthen pair bonds, which is a disadvantage. But that's another story. We're not going to say anything about that right now. Also, your parrots gain life experience and you gain confidence as a parrot owner. And now you know, if you can't find somebody to take care of your birds, you can always pack them along. It definitely is an option. But let's now, now that you've heard about my experience, let's return to the more generic concerns that many people have. Uh, because these are very real. How's the parrot going to behave? How's he going to be in a small cage? Uh, what if he's a feather damager? Is he going to pull all his feathers out because of this experience? Um, is he going to throw up riding in the car? You know, maybe the only time you've ever taken your bird uh, for a ride in the car was to the vet clinic, and that probably didn't go well. And then what about the overall stress of the experience? In terms of the parrot's behavior, you can wipe that concern right off the slate because problem behavior is almost always tied to the location in which it is displayed. So loud birds at home are rarely loud when you take them any other place. Um, and that's because neophobic responses will cause your parrot to just kind of naturally tamp down or modify his more normal behavior. So you really don't need to worry that your bird's going to scream in the hotel room or anything like that. It just doesn't happen. My Moluccan, I don't think he screamed one time. He's not a screamer anyway. He's a, a very quiet bird, but he will sound off first thing in the morning and then once about five, between five and 5.30 in the evening. And um, he was quiet the whole time. So you don't have to worry about that. As far as caging, here's some ideas for you. You get the, the size cage, that your car will accommodate one of those collapsible carriers. But then think about 
providing a similar but larger cage for your destination. You can just get, you can, you know, the one that I showed you in that photo was made for parrots, but you can go to any Petco or PetSmart store and find the Midwest dog kennels and just, you know, get a size or two up to use as a cage for the destination. It will conflict, I'm sorry, it will accommodate, you know, another perch or two and a toy or two, whereas the carrier for the car may not. Or if you routinely go back and forth, maybe you have a daughter that you visit. Think about just buying a 24 inch cage for the daughter's house and leaving it there. Um, lots of people do that. I have clients who have two homes and that's how they manage. Any people are worried about traveling in the car, usually they're most worried because in the past when they've put the bird in the car, the birds seem distressed by just the visual experience, you know, so it, the bird was flapping uncontrollably in the cage in distress. It's a good idea. This is why I brought my towels with me. I wasn't sure how my birds were gonna be on this trip. As it turned out, I didn't need to drape the towels over the carriers, but if you need to, do it. Just keep the side where the parrot can see you open and that will cut down on any distress from cars passing by. Many people worry about car sickness. I've only actually had one case in which a bird became car sick. She would routinely vomit and then lose consciousness um, on trips to the vet. I've never known of another case like this, but what we found in her case was that training stopped the car sickness. So was it a case where her stress encouraged the, or made more likely the regurgitation, I have no idea. But this was a girl who needs to travel for her own medical care. And thus it was important that we train her little bird and we did find that that was successful. Ginger tea also can be helpful. Ginger is a natural uh, nausea aid. Now, if you offer your bird a cup of ginger tea out of the blue, he's not likely to enjoy it, right? So if you anticipate needing to use this as a remedy, or if you wanna try it out, then you need to start drinking ginger tea. Make yourself a cup once a day, sweeten it with stevia, and when it gets cool enough, allow your bird to enjoy it with you then you'll be able to use it as a companionable aid while you're traveling. You can carry iced ginger tea with you and even make ginger ice cubes and put that in the water dish. And then I'm not sure that we have ever explored the possibility of compounding some of the human uh, grade anti-nausea medications like Zofran or um, promethazine. There are a lot of human medications that we currently use off label. So this really is not any kind of, you know, crazy suggestion. It would just take talking to a vet your veterinarian about it and seeing if he could do some research. But I just want you to know there are solutions. You might have to work with a behavior consultant to find the best one, but it's not anything that makes it impossible for your bird to travel. The best candidates for travel are going to be compliant parrots. Those are the birds that step up every time you ask them to. They go back into the cage whenever you ask them to. You don't want to get into a situation in the morning where you have to chase the bird around to get it into the carrier. So if, if you have to work on compliance first, do that before you try and travel with your bird. And then obviously birds who suffer from extreme fear or aggression are not going to, you know, the child, it's going to be challenging enough traveling with a compliant parent, much less one that has a lot of behavior challenges. Now, I mentioned feather damaging behavior before. 
Um, most people still believe that stress is a primary cause of feather damaging behavior. I started out thinking, like everybody else did, that that was probably true. It seemed logical. It is not true. Uh, stress is very rarely actually a component of feather damaging behavior, unless you're just talking about the stress inherent in living in cages in captivity. Um, but what I mean is that if a bird feather damages routinely, um, that doesn't mean that he is necessarily a stressed out bird routinely or that increased stress will increase the feather damaging behavior. Both um, Cyrano and Ruby have displayed feather damaging behavior in the past. Ruby, in fact, was in the process of damaging some flight feathers at the time that we traveled. Cyrano did not feather damage as a result of this trip. He never feather damaged during the trip, and he did not afterwards. And Ruby did not feather damage during the trip. So in other words, she didn't escalate what she was already doing, and she resolved the problem once she got here all on her own. So it's not a sure thing that your birds are going to start feather picking because of the stress of travel. They, a feather damaging bird can be a very good candidate for traveling with you. Let's put it that way. Okay, so what if you think now after this discussion that maybe your bird isn't ready for travel, that you might like to contemplate it for the future. This is the training priority list I suggest that you follow. First of all, if your bird is not a 99% stepper upper, then you need to work on that. You, I would like you to teach your bird to target. If you have a flighted bird, I then want you to teach that bird to recall. I want you to teach the bird to enter the carrier on cue. And then we also would benefit from some practice riding in the car, right? So how are we gonna do this? Okay, improving step up behavior. I'm gonna give you guys specific instructions for doing this. Now, before I do, I wanna to say to you, this is not for the bird who is afraid of stepping up. If your bird is terrified of hands and that's the reason why he doesn't step up, then call me for a consultation um, because you're not going to use this process. You're gonna to have to uh, follow a completely separate lineup of, um, training experiences. So this is what you're going to use with the bird who just steps up when he wants to, right? Eh, maybe I want to, maybe I don't, right? Okay, so for the birds to step up 50% of the time or more, and um, but who could be a lot better at it, we're going to do it this way. You're going to go get a high value food treat that you know your bird wants, and you're gonna show it, and you're gonna present your hand in the same position that you would when you're asking for the bird to step up, but you're not gonna bring your hand in close enough that the bird can actually get on it. So this first step is simply communication. Look what I have, would you like to earn it? If so, you can do this, you can step up. And then when you have your hands in place, you watch the bird's body language because what you're watching for is for the bird to bring his foot up. That's what you wanna see. That is called a start button. A start button in behavior terms is a behavior that the bird offers you that indicates, yes, he does indeed want to, um, engage in the behavior that you are suggesting. So when he brings his foot up, you bring your hand in, let him get on your hand, immediately deliver the reinforcer, and then again, watch his behavior. If he starts eating the treat right away, then just hold him there so he can eat the treat before you put him down. If he doesn't start eating it, but he's holding it in his beak, then I want you to turn your hand around 180 degrees and allow him to step off, back off of it onto a perch or onto the cage. The reason that you turn your hand around 
and let him step off that way is because it's easier for the bird. He gets to step forward, at least for him, as opposed to stepping sideways or backward, which could result in a misstep. And then I want you to do that just once, twice, or three times a day. Please do not ask for multiple step ups in order to try and teach your bird that way. I don't know why, but this tends to make parrots angry. You're more likely to be bitten. And you also don't really have a way to reward, you know, to deliver a reinforcer every time that you ask for that behavior. And that is an important part of the process. You, one behavior, one reward. Okay, what do you do if your bird doesn't bring his foot up? That's fine. If he doesn't bring his foot up and you're just gonna wait for like, I don't know, maybe three seconds. Don't wait forever. Um, just wait for three seconds. And if that little foot has not come up, then turn your back, walk away for no more than 10 seconds, and then come back and go through exactly the same process again to give them a second chance. Because many birds will, they'll think about it and they'll be like, darn, <laughs> I know that I uh, just lost the opportunity to earn that food. And I really did want that after all. So um, in that way, then you might get a positive response the second time. If you don't get the foot up the second time, then walk away and try again later. For the behavior nerds in the crowd, we are using positive reinforcement with negative punishment in this exercise. And it works very, very well. It's very effective. As far as targeting goes, uh, I want you to use a chopstick. I do not want you to use the clicker unless you tell me that you have to. Why? Why don't you need to use a clicker? I'm going to tell you a secret, okay? If you can deliver a reinforcer immediately, you don't need the clicker. So when you're training, targeting, or turnarounds, or anything like that, where you're right in front of the bird, you don't need a bridge because you've got that reinforcer up to that bird's beak right away. And often, if if you're new to targeting, it's gonna feel very awkward to you. And having to manage a clicker is just one more piece of equipment that you really don't need. Um, you want to use miniature reinforcers and practice during your down times, manipulating those reinforcers. So uh, maybe while you're watching television, you're gonna be breaking nut treats apart in your palm and then practicing just moving those up from your palm to your two fingers. Um, and then, you know, don't make it hard. Just spend five minutes, spend three minutes, spend the time it takes your tea water to boil doing some targeting with your bird. You know, don't make it hard. Make it fun and make it easy. Recall. Recall is just merely a step up with distance, right? So you just start with a step up. And then maybe, you know, after your bird steps up and goes back, steps up and goes back a couple of times, no problem. Just take one step backwards and maybe ask for a hop and a flap to get to your hand. And then you just gradually increase the distance that you ask your bird to fly. There are other ways also to teach this. Um, it, and it really is not hard. I do think it's important to, in this case, use both a visual and a verbal cue. It, when I train, I, I follow the lead that Barbara Heidenreich sets for us. I'm a quiet trainer. I don't talk. But if I'm working on recall, I want to use a verbal cue also because I want to protect against the day when my bird might get outside by accident and may not be able to see me. And I want her to be able to hear me say, Marco, fly here, <laughs> so that she will come to my hand, even if she can't see me. You can just practice that um, by asking a bird to fly from one room to you in another room. All right, how can you train your bird to go into a carrier? 
if you want to just work on putting your bird in the carrier for a reinforcer, you can do that, but it's so much more fun to just be able to ask a parrot to walk into her own carrier um, on cue. So, and this too is not difficult to teach. I do this with clients all the time on Zoom, yet much less. So that just proves that this is not rocket science. So, when you train your bird to walk into the carrier, you wanna work on a flat surface. So if they're not comfortable being on a flat surface, that would be your first step, just getting them used to walking around. You know, just put a bunch of food down there and let them get used to walking around on a flat surface and forage a little bit. And then, so I like to use dining room tables for this, or maybe kitchen counters that offer us some length. And you're going to use targeting for this. You could just use food, but parrots have so much fun targeting that if you teach carrier training with food and targeting, they train better than if you only use food. So you're going to begin at the distance that I say the parrot has chosen. Okay, what does that mean? It, what it means is you're going to put the the carrier at one end of your flat length, whatever that may be. And then the parrot's probably gonna wanna be as far away from that as possible. So you just, you know, you choose the distance at which the parrot does not show any fear of the carrier. And you just start targeting. You just ask them to target right there. You're, you don't tap the table or, I mean, it's just very simple. Just right there on the table, you just start targeting with them. And as, you know, after the first few repetitions, when they go well, then you just move the target stick, the next approximation to a spot, say an inch closer to the carrier. And you ask the parrot to target there. And then it's another inch closer to, to the carrier. Gradually, you the parrot will target closer and closer and closer to the carrier itself until you get all the way up to the door itself, which of course will be open so that the bird can walk into the carrier. That's another reason why these um, collapsible crates are really best because the bird can easily get over that threshold and into the bottom of the crate. Uh, let's see. So things are going to bog down when you get up to the door to the crate, but we have answers for that also. You may need to use just a little bit more valuable food treat for the reinforcement. And you may need to make your approximations just a little smaller, but that is, that's it. That's all you have to do. And you just insert your target stick through the cage bars, maybe from the top or the side of the carrier. And by doing that, you are able to create small little approximations for your bird up over the threshold and then farther and farther into the back of the carrier. Okay, riding in the car. I don't really think much preparation is needed for this, although it just makes sense to sharp start sorry with short times and distances and make it fun go through the drive through or something you know get a burger and fries and share a little unhealthy food with your bird or something of course we would never do that um, and then gradually increase the distance you go to up to 30 minutes. That I just picked as an arbitrary figure, but I kind of think that if your bird can ride in the car for 30 minutes, your bird can ride in the car for six hours. You know, my birds had never ridden in the car for six hours, but they did it and they didn't seem to show any ill effects from it. So in summary, my belief is companion parrots don't get enough life experience and they especially don't get enough life experience that embodies inclusivity with the whole family flock. 
So I think there are huge benefits from always practicing inclusivity with our birds. Bring their cages into the living room so we all live together there in the living room. Take your birds with you when you travel. Take them with you around the house into different rooms. They are flock animals who thrive on inclusivity. And, you know, if your individual parrot needs a little bit of training for preparation, no worries, I'm here. So call me or somebody else, get help if you need it, because this is really so much fun and it's easy to do. Nobody should make a decision not to based upon fear. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I took too long when I- <laughs> No, it was very thorough. So I was fascinated, I was very thorough. Yeah, covered so many, so much ground. Um, we do have a question if you, uh, someone um, wants to know, uh, a lot of questions about airlines specifically. Um, okay. So uh, airlines carrying birds, can you announce, oh, they say that, uh, this is from Brenda actually, uh, Delta, Alaska, Frontier are the only US airlines that carry birds. Um, and it's in the cabin with the owner, so. Yeah. That's your, pretty much your choices now, currently, but those can always change too. Yes. So always, always check when you're booking a flight, right? Um, beforehand. And, uh, oh, so Shelly wants to know, uh, do you cover the carriers while in the car um, or do they like to look out the windows um, and do you make sure that they can see you? So when you have the you, flock with you, where should they be in the car? Like specifically, where do you stow them? <laughs> in the back seat. Yeah, that was, um, I, I had a Ford Fusion and the back seat folded down. So that was what I did because that gave me essentially like a station wagon base. So I just had them wedged in there. I mean, since I was also moving my house, there was not one empty centimeter of space in that car. <laughs> so we were pretty well packed in there tightly. Now, whether you cover the carrier or not is gonna depend upon your individual bird. I wasn't sure how my birds would respond. They did not seem afraid of the traffic passing by them, but if your bird is, then you would cover three sides of the cage so that um, they could see you, but were protected from seeing anything that scared them. Okay. Uh, oh, I had a quick question too, is um, would, would you ever recommend or consider any, scenario where you might have two birds in the same carrier when you're traveling? Or are they always going to be separate? I think they should always be separate as a general guideline because you want to avoid any potential for problems, right? Okay. And um, birds can behave in unexpected ways. That's all. So, you know, you just, and also there could be competition for food, carriers by virtue of the fact that that's what they are, are gonna be smaller. So, you know, if you had two birds in a carrier, you'd wanna have, well, I was gonna say two food dishes. I just think it, you would have more opportunity for risky things happening if you put two birds in one carrier. So the only way that I would do that if I knew if I knew my birds very, very well and they were small birds. Yeah. So, you know, budgies, cockatiels, other small birds, if they're pair bonded, then they could probably be in a carrier together. But that would be a study of one type of question. Because if the birds ever show any sort of snarky behavior towards each other, as most bonded parrots do quite normally, um, it, you know, it might be that they could share a carrier at home, but not a carrier on the road. It would just depend upon the individual birds. Okay. Oh, I, I have a really quick story. I'll be really quick with it. Uh, my experience, I had an adverse reaction to uh, <laughs> trying to travel with my Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. I used to, I used to, when I had a stoplight, for example, like kind of give them uh, chin scratches between the cage bars, the, you know, kind of like, Hey, how's it going back there, buddy? Well, the first time I traveled with a, my relatively newly adopted Nande Conyer, 
um, I wasn't paying attention to my Amazon's body language. And so apparently he had a huge crush on the Nandy Conyer and the carrier next to him. So when I went back to kind of give him a little scratch, he <laughs> latched onto my finger <laughs> and I couldn't bring it back. And so I had a stick shift at the time and I'm trying to drive with my hand stuck in an Amazon's beak driving from a stoplight. <laughs> and so I was able to like pull in uh, to the side of the road and, and I had to extricate my finger from his bill. And I learned the hard way that behaviors can change when you change dynamics in a car. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the story because that's immediately, or that's um, actually exactly what I was thinking about. Uh, that, you know, you change circumstances and behaviors can change and birds can get into trouble very quickly. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so I have a little oh, scrama. <laughs> I got a little evidence a reminder every time. <laughs> so, all right, we have a question from Deanna. She asks, uh, do you have any concern about cleanliness or odors in a hotel room? And are there any hotel chains you would recommend um, for bird owners to stay in? Any <laughs> You must think I am quite the gad about. <laughs> in reality, I can't even remember the last time I stayed in a hotel. Um, but that said, I have stayed in them. So I can answer your question. And that is no, I would not have any worries or concerns about that. I think that the information that is available to us currently about um aerosolized substances that could be toxic is very uh, problematic. There's a lot of wrong information out there. It has been assumed that certain things are toxic that I happen to know absolutely are not. And so since, you know, even if air fresheners were used in a hotel room, it's not going to bother your parent. Mm. Yeah. And maybe put up the little really like, uh, no service or do not disturb signs up your word. Yes. Right? Yeah, that that was what I did because I have stayed in hotels with parents. So I always put up the do not disturb sign uh, and locked the door as well, you know, had the bolt on there. So because I've I have learned since that in some hotels, even if you put the do not disturb sign out, they will still come in and clean your room. Mm. Good point. So Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see, Tina wanted to know if you could oh, I'll talk a little bit about your experience with air knobs, uh, or, I'm sorry, air and B&Bs. Um, so do you tell the host that you're bringing your birds? Do you like coordinate oh. with them ahead of time? So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I don't want to ever show up with just unannounced birds at someone's. <laughs> oh, no, no, you would never want to do that. No, I actually had a friend who did the bookings for me because she was so familiar with Airbnb. But um, no, she just chose the ones um, that said that they accepted pets and then she corresponded with them to make sure that parrots were okay. And do you, was there any kind of, uh, that they also want to know about, about, do you have to keep them in the cage mostly when you're there? Or do you let the host know ahead of time? Like, you know, or is it assumed that you're going to be letting them out when you book it? Nobody said a word. <laughs> okay. And my advice would be the less said, the best. You know, just ask, are parrots okay? And if they say yes, then zip it. <laughs> you know, don't give them a reason to say, oh, you know, now that you told me that, I think actually parrots may not be okay. 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 Yeah. Maybe say bird instead of parrot. I don't know. Sort of in their, in their head. You have like a macaw versus a little budgie. <laughs> um. I, I don't know. I mean, people were. People were very, very um, friendly about the whole thing. They didn't seem to, not one person raised an issue about the word parrot or bird or anything else. And in fact, so my friend that booked the Airbnb, she actually did some traveling with an African gray this year as well. And when she booked in at a hotel room, they were so excited to see the parrot that some of the staff stayed behind on their shifts so that they could be there when she arrived with the bird. Oh, yeah, Mich cute. Michelle has a comment here. She says, I've stayed in a hotel with my BE2, and the only issue was that the staff kept wanting to visit. So. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah, That's most people much. don't know enough about parrots to think that there would be a reason why they might not want them. Fascinating, okay. Uh, right. And it looks like our last question will be from Jay. Uh, okay. They wanna know, what if a bird is aggressive with the treats when you're trying to train? Um, aggressive with the treats, that's interesting. There can be many ways to deal with that particular problem when you're training that have to do with treat delivery. But I would first just say, make sure that your bird is not aggressive towards you. Because if your bird has, um, if your bird is focusing on you with an aggressive demeanor, it is not a good time to train. And in fact, you might have to do some other type of training, like use the constructional approach before you could even do any positive reinforcement training. So for the sake of this question, we're going to assume that this parrot is just snarky about taking treats, but is otherwise a lovely non-aggressive bird. So most of the time when you get bitten, when you're offering treats, it's simply because you bring them up too close to the bird's beak. So you can bring the treat up slowly and let the bird lean. And gradually you come to a place where the bird, if she leans any farther, she's gonna fall. And at that point, you know, you can safely offer the treat because she's thinking about keeping her balance and accessing the treat rather than biting you. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways as well. You can take a dinner knife or a tongue depressor and spread it with either peanut butter or cream cheese and then stick your reinforcers down onto that so they won't fall off. And then you can just bring the stick up and offer it and then pull it away. Uh, you can do that with a piece of millet. Also cut a two inch piece of millet spray so that you've got a little buffer zone there. You just hold one end and bring it up, let the bird take a bite or two and pull it back. And then another tricky thing you can do, this may gross some people out, but I wouldn't mind doing it myself. Go outside and get a stick off of a tree, a little twig, about mm -hmm. six inches long. And if you feel like you need to wash it, go for it. And then after you've dried it, dip the end in a little bit of peanut butter and then swirl it in crushed walnuts. And so the beauty of this is parents are not usually afraid of twigs, whereas they might react to a popsicle stick. Um, and so I've used that also very effectively as well. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um... Let's see, I have to announce the winner of today's um, Lefebvre's uh, collector's tin. That's the one that's filled with the new banana Nutriberries. Um, and that is going to go out to Frank. Frank uh, carries. Um, you are going to get that as well as another Lefebvre product of your bird's choice. So Lefebvre will- That's fantastic. Yeah. I know Frank. Yeah. Wow. I do know Frank very well. <laughs> hey. Congratulations, Frank. And thanks for being here. <laughs> I hope your bird loves it. Um, the tin is awesome. I'm I'm saving mine for. Uh, I can't wait to put some some more treats in there. Just uh, it's they're really cute. They're, I don't have the tin with me, but yeah. um, it's like a beautiful gold tin. Um, and then Brenda wanted to point out real quick that the U.S. airlines that carry um, birds Delta Alaska Frontier only their flights, not code share flights, such as Alaska code share with American. So just bad check before you book flights, just to make sure you're hitting all the dots. Uh, so checking all the boxes. Um, all right. And so on that note, I'm also going to announce, so family, you're going to be on again with us next Friday. Is that right? Is that yeah. already August? Oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. So next Friday. Wow. This is a topic that I think is long overdue. I'm very excited about this one too. And it's uh, another episode, the second episode of Translating Parrot. It's going to be cockatoos unraveling the mysteries. That one is, do not miss that one. I'm, <laughs> this is going to be a fascinating topic. Um, yeah, we haven't dedicated a whole webinar to cockatoos yet, so I am very excited about that. Um, all right, guys, on that note, I'm going to have to wish everyone a wonderful weekend. Um, Pamela, once again, it's so great to have you part of our webinars. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just such a treat and a great presentation, great way to kickstart it. And um, everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you and your flock, and we'll okay. see you next Friday. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care.